All right, Tanse Toya, everyone. Again, my name is Jamie Bork Blyne. I am from Pasqua Mustu Siagan, the Buffalo Lake Metis Settlement in Treaty 6 territory. I'm also the engagement manager with Indigenous Climate Action. Um, and today we uh, put together, we're, we're launching a just transition guide for community members to have access to. And I know some folks, like when I started ICA, I'm not going to lie, I did not know what just transition was. Um, <laughs> I, I joined the team to share, uh, help with communications and engagement. Uh, and there's a lot that I'm learning at ICA. So what we basically want to do is we're going to answer some of these questions for you if you don't know exactly what it is. So for housekeeping, we did our demo of how to win the dollars. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the bios of our of a couple of folks who are going to be leading us through what a JT guide is and sharing some of the experiences of Indigenous members and communities as they incorporate just transition into, into, into their lives and into the lives of their community. So we have Molina. So Molina Labican Massimo is Lubican Cree from Northern Alberta. Molina is the founder of Sacred Earth Solar and co-founder of Indigenous Climate Action. Molina is the inaugural fellow at the David Suzuki Foundation, where her research focused on climate change, indigenous knowledge, and renewable energy. She is the host of the TV doc series, Power to the People, which profiles renewable energy in indigenous communities across the country. Melina holds a master's degree in indigenous governance at the University of Victoria with a focus on renewable energy. As a part of her master's thesis, Melina implemented a 20, <laughs> a 20 .8 kilowatt solar project in her community of Little Buffalo, which powers the health center and the heart of the tar sands. Hi, Melina. Uh, we're also going to introduce Julius here. And Julius is the Director of Sustainable Communities at the David Suzuki Foundation. He leads the foundation's work to accelerate and raise ambition of climate action in cities, in cities across the place known as Canada. He is also co-founder of the Black Environmental Alliance, an organization that seeks to champion Black folks in the environmental profession provide a safe space for peer-to-peer -peer engagement, to have real conversations, and to share experiences and to advocate for environmental justice for Black Canadians now and in the future. Hi, Melina, and hi, Julius. And say hello. Okay, so we wanted to start today because we didn't want to make the assumption for folks coming to this call to learn about what Just Transition actually is. And so we thought we'd go over um, just like a a term for you, just like a term, like a definition, and then we'll go into the actual guide. And then we're going to open up to community members that are here with us today that um, are leading the way. They're literally leading the way in um, the future for just clean energy. Just putting my phone on, do not disturb. But so basically, if you don't know, if you haven't heard the term, but people maybe even have heard the term of just transition, but a lot of times we don't know exactly where it comes from, why it's there, but the term actually originated from labor unions, environmental justice advocates, and low community, low income communities of color. Because although there's not a universal definition right now, but the term generally refers to the social justice framework that considers, prioritizes, and ensures equitable outcomes for workers and communities. So when we're implementing policies and, and trying to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, trying to transition from fossil fuels, we need to see equitable um, solutions in community to make sure communities aren't left behind. So in the case of just transition, this means access to transition technologies and equity for communities in transition. And that also takes into consideration communities that who have, who have been historically marginalized, including women, two-spirited people, Black and Indigenous communities, immigrants, and other structurally oppressed and racialized communities. The definition of just transition has um, expanded now. It represents a range of strategies and principles to transition whole communities to become building, like building the thriving um, economic economies that provide dignified, productive, and ecological sustainable livelihoods through democratic governance, indigenous governance, and for ecological resilience. And so if you want to look up this term more, you can 
They, this definition was derived from the Climate Justice Alliance and the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. And also you can just read the Just Transition Guide, which is 180 pages of research that's been put together for love and care for communities. So I'm so excited today to launch the Just Transition Guide because it is literally showing details of Indigenous-led pathways towards equitable climate solutions and resiliency facing the climate crisis, because we all know what's happening right now. It's coming more and more, and we see it every day in the news. We see it every day on social media. You know, 15, 20 years ago when I started working on climate, it was hard to even convince people that it exists, and now there's no question that it, it exists. So the Just Transition Guide that we are launching this week, we're excited to share the stories of Indigenous communities that are leading the way in eco-housing, food security, renewable energy. And we're very grateful for the time that they took to share with us that are profiled in the Just Transition Guide, but are also here with us today. So you'll hear from community leaders very shortly around the climate solutions that they've implemented in their communities. And we really know, there's no doubt about it, especially for Indigenous peoples on this call, that climate solutions that are implemented in community by community for community also support indigenous cultures and languages and also that indigenous knowledge and indigenous science creates community resilience in the face of the climate crisis so this 180 page document is meant to inspire support and support communities in their and workers in their transition to wards renewable energy but also just building healthier mm -hmm. a healthier planet for all human and non-human kin so the contents here um, i'll go over a little bit more later um, before we open it up for q a but there's seven different um, sections but there's one is like a case study of my master's thesis where i implemented a renewable energy project um, and then it's also shows um, where we have the people here today that have been profiled in a docu-series that I hosted called Power to the People, and it was with Real World Media, and it profiled communities from coast to coast to coast that are implementing a multitude of climate solutions. And also it's showing voices of community and also wisdom of community. So community wisdom quotes throughout the guide, which talk about how indigenous communities are um, leading the way at the forefront of, a, of transition technologies. And I'm so in awe of the community leaders and all the leaders that I met across the country that we profiled. I'm incredibly grateful for the experiences and the relationships I built during filming Power to the People. Because I don't know if you know, but over 2000 indigenous led renewable energy projects are in motion across Turtle Island in so-called Canada and Indigenous peoples are without a doubt leading this transition but a lot of times people don't know that. I don't know if you also know that outside of utilities Indigenous communities are the largest asset holders of clean energy out you know so this just shows that we are literally the largest change agents in clean energy and that data came from our fellow um, organization that we love so much Indigenous Clean Energy and so we know that we're in the midst. And I also just wanted to close really quick for this part of the section before we move on to community stories is that this guide was made possible by the partnership between Sacred Earth Solar, Indigenous Climate Action in collaboration with Power to the People and the David Suzuki Foundation. Of course, without the work of the communities, this guide would not exist. And so this guide is a, intended to be a collective resource that ultimately makes it possible for us to build upon the knowledge that's already out there. And it's my hope that the Just Transition Guide will inspire and support implementation on the ground um, for years to come. And so before we open up into community stories um, that we're so excited to share with you, I just wanted to thank all of the organizations, authors, and contributors including the David Suzuki um, Foundation, Indigenous Climate Action, Power to the People, Real World Media. And I'll quickly pass it over to Julius, um, who's the Director of Sustainable Communities at the David Suzuki Foundation for a couple of words here. And then we'll turn it over to the communities and to share their stories. Hi, hi, thank you so much. Hi, Melina. Uh, thanks for the chance to speak and hello everybody. And I'm really excited also to be here today to be part of the community launch of the Just Transition Guide. And here at the foundation, our sort of climate work is increasingly moving in this direction of equity and intersectionality. And in particular, 
uh, the work that my team is doing for the sustainable communities is has a large component about talking about stories of the just transition. And so we've been we're really happy and and um, really excited to be a part of this work as it relates to indigenous communities. And centering communities is really, you know, central to solving the climate crisis. And as Melina said, this guide provides some pretty concrete ways in which um, that transition can happen and that and the fact that it's very clear that Indigenous communities are um, leading in this area and leading this work. And I've been at the foundation for two years, so I'm um, a latecomer to this effort, but I've, there's been a lot of people involved in, and I feel really fortunate to have been um, a part of this effort. And so thanks for having me and I'll pass it back to you. Hi, hi, I will pass it back to you, Jamie. Thank you, Julius. Thank you, Melina. Uh, just so everyone knows, before we go a little bit further here, we are going to have a the last portion of today's um, launch. We're having the last 30 minutes. Before we do the draw for the $500 cash prizes, there is going to be a section for question and answers. So we're going to open up the chat for a Q&A. So if folks can hopefully you know, write your questions down so you don't want to forget them. Please hold them for the end. We do want to engage with you all today, and we ask that we hold it for the last 30 minutes. So to carry on, uh, thank you both for sharing uh, what Just Transition is and to know that this is a 180-page document on Just Transition that we want to share with community. Melina, is this, this guide going to be available uh, for download? Like, how, how can folks get their hand on it? It is available for download. We will put it in the chat in the Q&A, but you just have to go to um, sacredearth.solar um, slash just transition and you can download the executive summary and you can download the actual full guide. It's live right now today. Perfect. Thank you so much. And some of the, the guide contains examples, like Melina mentioned, Indigenous communities are leading the way in uh, alternative energy and uh, 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 for just transition. And we have a few folks who are showcased, share, uh, show, uh, in highlighted yep. in the guide. Uh, mm -hmm. So we're going to introduce them all to you now. Um, so we're going to start here. I'm going to read everyone's bio after they all introduce themselves one at a time. So we're going to start here with AJ. AJ, would you like to introduce yourself and then I will share your bio? Sure. Miigwech. Uh, thank you, Jamie. AJ Shkwegan, Indigenous Kaz, Kashki Zaging, and Donji. My name is AJ Shkwegan. I come from Gold Bay First Nation. I'm happy to be here to share uh, the solar microgrid story I have. And I'll let Jamie finish off the intro. Thanks, AJ. So, uh, so AJ comes from. Oh my goodness! I like I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna murder these words, these Indigenous words. Kiaske Sagin and. Shabak, no, Gull Bay First Nation, Gull Dex, my apologies, an Ojibwe community in the Robinson Superior Treaty area and region of Northwestern Ontario. He has the privilege and honor in serving his community as the Mashkawayan Energy Projects Coordinator, the, the liaison between chief and council, members, partners, funders, vendors, and various levels of government. In 2019, he celebrated with his community the completion of Gilz oh my goodness, Gil Gilzee's Energy Microgrid, Canada's first fully integrated remote renewable energy storage microgrid, a project showcased with Melina Lubican Massimo on the TV series Power to the People. He is a graduate of Indigenous Clean Energy uh, 2020 Catalyst Program a Canada's Clean 50 2021 Emerging Leader Award recipient and proud husband and daddy of, of, and community energy champion. Miigwech. Thank you, AJ. Thank you for being here. Miigwech. Thank you. Uh, Saya. We have Saya here as well. Saya, would you like to introduce yourself and then I'll read your bio? <laughs> uh, I know I didn't send in a bio, so I just, uh, yeah, Saya Masu, the Lands and Resource Director for Tlaoquit. Um, you know, I have a degree in economics and a master's in Indigenous governance, and I've been home about 20 years, and uh, throughout that, we uh, run our tribal parks program and uh, decipher what footprints we want in our in our mountainous uh, watersheds, and in there, we've 
established three run of river hydro projects um, that I was uh, helping steer from a feasibility study right through to completion. And uh, our nation is, uh, I'm very happy to share that story later today. Thank, Thank you. you Saya. Let go. So I also uh, worked on the nation's economic development corporations who established a three run of river hydroelectric projects. Uh, thank you, thank you, Saya. Next, we have Troy. Troy, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and I can read your bio? Hi everyone, nice to be with you all today. I'm honored to be here. I'm a Mi'kmaq from the community of Alistaguch in Gispegawagi. So we inhabit uh, half of Canada. If you think about it province-wide, uh, the Mi'kmaq are on uh, Quebec, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI, Newfoundland. Uh, my community, Listigudge, is on the uh, Quebec portion of, th of this. Um, we're salmon people. Uh, we went to war a couple of times with the government to make sure that we had continued to have access to salmon. So we're very strong in terms of uh, knowing what our rights are, fighting for our rights. Uh, we do see climate change affecting our rivers, and you know we are mindful of, of, of that. We're watching what's happening. Um, you know we see different species coming in. We're wondering if these species could take over and upset the uh, you know upset the whole environment. Um, we are you know we are also people working in the uh, commercial fishery. We in 19, in in the last century <laughs> we had a Marshall decision that really recognized uh, Mi'kmaq rights. So now we're in the commercial fishery, and there again. We do see uh, climate change uh, have an effect on that. So for us, uh, it was nice for us to be able to take part in uh, creating a clean energy project and helping, um, you know, our community and actually all of Gespegawagi have access to the uh, our territory and have access to our wind that flies over our territory. I'll talk a bit more of our project later. I uh, want to make sure that I always mention my son Neskowen. Um, hopefully, he'll, one day he'll be able to see this. He's five year old probably home playing with his brother now, um, you know, doing all kinds of crazy things, but uh, hi, Nesquen, and thanks, and uh, look forward to talk to you more about our Mesquite Ukchus and Wind Farm project soon. So Troy, thank you, Troy. Troy is also a citizen, like you mentioned, a citizen of the Mi'kmaq Nation, residing in Quebec. He has devoted much of his career serving the Mi'kmaq Nation as a firm believer in the inherent right to self-government and their permanent sovereignty over their lands and resources. From 2004, Jerome began to closely monitor the development of the wind energy wind energy industry, taking hold in Gaswaki. Sorry about that, Troy. Seeing that Quebec. Gaspegawagi. Gaspegawagi. Oh, shoot, I tried. Seeing that Quebec was mobilizing to install over 40% of its 4,000 um, of wind energy projects. 4 billion invested in his people's territory. He pushed to have chief and council demand that the Quebec assembly discuss energy projects with the Mi'kmaq and nation to nation basis. Mr. Jerome was asked to serve as the executive director of Nisawagi for the Mi'kmaq of Jessipe, oh my God, political lobbying office of the Mi'kmaqi. <laughs> oh my God, worse. Mi'kmaqi Mawari Secretariat, the MS, MMS, the initiative was considered successful with a 150 meg megawatt wind farm became operational in December 2016. This Mi'kmaq wind farm continues to bring power to 30,000 households. Oh, that's impressive. Mr. Jerome also serves as a co-chair and mentor with the Indigenous Clean Energy Social Enterprise, supporting the Indigenous communities and becoming energy independent and helping Indigenous nations lead away from fossil fuels and the transition into renewable and clean energy. Thank you, Troy. Very happy to have you here with us today. And last but not least, we have the amazing Serena. Serena, would you like to introduce yourself in the Nike Reader but final bio? Sounds good. Uh, thank you so much, Niago Jamie, for being the wonderful MC today. Uh, Hi, my name is Serena Mondisabal. I am a Kugo Wolf Clan woman from the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory. I am 25 years old, so I'm bringing that young woman perspective today. And I'm really excited to be here. I am the Just Transition Lead at Sacred Earth Solar. I've been working with Melina uh, and pushing forward our programs around climate and clean energy solutions, education, advocacy policy, as well as healing justice. 
I just want to give a shout out to my community of Six Nations. I'm a proud Haudenosaunee woman and uh, really am just grateful to be here today. I also am a graduate of the 2020 Catalyst program from this past summer. So I'm quite honored to be speaking on a panel with some of my mentors, AJ, Melina, Troy, as well as Saya, watching you on Power of the People. You're all very inspiring and and I'm just really grateful for the space today. And I hope we can really push forward the message of a just transition and, and how we can put indigenous self-determination at the forefront. So yeah, I'll go ahead. Thank you, Serena. Serena is, also, is a community-based researcher and grassroots organizer. Serena graduated from the Western University with a master's of geography and environment with a focus on indigenous environmental health governance alongside East Coast communities. Uh, Serena is the Just Transition Lead at Sacred Earth Solar, the co-chair of 7 Gen National Indigenous Youth Energy Council, a subject matter expert on connecting for climate change action, and works in her community with Protect the Tract, a Haudenosaunee-led group enforcing the Haudenosaunee Confederacy uh, on development along the Grand River. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for putting up with me with uh, trying to speak words other than English and Cree. Uh, <laughs> uh, so next, um, we're going to go into uh, a period here where we're going to be showing five short videos. Each of these videos showcase some of the work that we are talking about today that each of the panelists have were directly involved with, and it's also shared in the Just Transition Guide. Um, so we're going to, if Katie is okay to start with the video, we are going to start with the Molina's First Nation, Lubican Cree First Nation. Molina, was there anything you want to say about the video before we start, or we should just share that for after? Sure. Save after. That for after. Sure. All right. Thanks, Katie. The Lubukan Cree have been here since time immemorial. Indigenous peoples have a very intimate connection with our homelands here in Northern Alberta. And what we've seen instead is industry coming and essentially taking over our lands and really exploiting them and it's had a detrimental impact. We see companies digging down into no the earth, trying to extract the very last drop of oil. But Wait, instead, we can start looking up. It, it, We're bathing in sunlight yep. all around us, and yet. Sorry about that, folks. Looks okay. like there's a problem with the video encoding here. Yeah, it was okay. Um, maybe just if Katie refreshes, and I can quickly just go over it. Um, and then she can do a refresh of the video, maybe just close it and open it. And then hopefully that doesn't happen with all the other videos, but it worked great on Monday when we were talking to the press about it. So it should be good to go. Let's just give it a refresh. Um, so just really quickly, this project went up in 2015. It was the basis of my master's thesis. And it was a project that I built with my community um, in Little Buffalo where I was born, Lubukon Cree. And it was really exciting because we were. Able, it was the first time we'd seen solar panels in our community. And my my auntie, who was in who's in her seventies, well, she's now in her eighties. Um, she came up to me and she was like, "Oh, this is the first time I've seen pan like solar panels in person. And I only think I'd seen them in on satellite. You know, like because everyone has a satellite now for TV in their community. It's a pretty remote community where ten hours are a well." It's eight hours from Calgary, but 10 hours there and back from Edmonton. So it's like, it's a remote place. So we had to learn how to build remote um, and bring all the type of technology into the community. So it was really exciting when the panels came in. So this video that we're going to show you really quick was just, it just shows the training and all of the different things of the celebration, um, having solar in the tar sands in our community for the first time, just trying to bring in a new, a new direction. So hopefully that, um, the video will come in and play okay now. Thanks, Katie, for re reboosting. The Lubukan Cree have been here since time immemorial. Indigenous peoples have a very intimate connection with our homelands here in Northern Alberta. 
And what we've seen instead is industry coming and essentially taking over our lands and really exploiting them and it's had a detrimental impact. We see companies digging down into the earth trying to extract the very last drop of oil. But instead, we can start looking up. We're bathing in sunlight all around us and yet we don't utilize that energy. And so that's why our community has decided to install solar. Pretty amazing to see this project go up. A lot of the community members and the young people are working, they're getting hands-on training right now. It's really amazing to see how proud people are of it and how it's, it's a community project because all of this has been through the blood, sweat and tears of the community. Well, this project matters to us because it kind of represents who we are and where we're going in the future. When you see the work, you can, I can say that I did. People, I worked on this. <laughs> I know uh, in a lot of the ceremonies and the songs, the sun is praised. You know, uh, even the project name, Pita Pan, means the coming of the dawn. And it's coming of a new era, you know, era where we use, uh, you know, energy that's not devastating to our environment. In uh, getting this solar project going, we are leaders in solar power. And that's what we're teaching our youth. You know, they have to learn how to operate it. They have to learn how to maintain it. And uh, they already know how to set it up. So if any, any of our neighbors in the surrounding First Nations or Métis settlements want to start a solar power, we can be there to help them get it going. Yeah, so you can, you can see most of it, but um, I won't take too long because I want to pass it on to the other speakers. But um, the biggest thing was this. This was the creation of why their Just Transition guide exists today, because I didn't have the guide back then. Um, I had to learn from trial and error to put this up in my community um, when I started a decade ago looking at energy transition. And if you want to watch it without the little box, um, hopefully for other ones that won't happen, but I think we should be good to go. Just go to um, uh, Sacred Earth Thought Solar and you can watch all of our videos that we've put up. That was the first project we put up and we put up multiple projects across Turtle Island. So feel free to go to that, to our website and look at other videos of other communities and in my community. So hi, hi, and I'll pass it back to you, Jamie. Um, and I'll put the link for Sacred Earth Solar uh, in the chat. Thank you, Melina. So we're going to go from Northern Alberta on the Lubican Cree. We're going to go all the way down to Gull Bay First Nation. Um, we're going to start by sharing the video, AJ, if that's okay. We're going to start with the video first. And then it'd be really great if you can talk a bit about your community and your experience with, with um, incorporating such a, um, the work that you've done there. Sorry. I'll be you got her. We're implementing a solar battery energy storage microgrid to offset about 25%, uh, 120,000 liters of diesel fuel a year for the community. You can see the diesel generator station. So this is the control room of the diesel Hydro One Remotes diesel generator. The generator, though. Okay. It's in the next room here. This is a diesel generator. Yeah, actually, this is what our clean solar microgrid project will be turning off. It's really great to be able to like stop using fossil fuels when the sun shines. That's right. Yeah, that's what it's all about. Let's take care of this planet. Solar microgrid. Solar. It speaks volumes to the transition that your community is making. Exactly, and that's a good transition.
So this is the solar battery energy storage microgrid site. It's gonna be offsetting about 25% of the diesel use. They're going to weld on extensions to these helical piles. And essentially what that is is the, the mount for the solar panels. So the racking system is gonna be mounted onto that, then they install the solar panels. I'll take you on to Canada's first fully integrated remote renewable energy storage microgrid. Communities are going to be utilizing this system for generations to come. Power to the people. Power to the people. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Pretty awesome. Milestone today. A couple months, you'll be fully on solar. All right, uh, yeah, so as you can see in that video, we uh, installed a battery storage solar microgrid in my community um, in 2019, August of 2019, August 16th, uh, that went live uh, and we celebrated. Um, but how that story started um, was actually a reconciliation with Ontario Power Generation. Um, back in the 1920s to the 1950s, there was about five dams that were constructed on Lake Nibigan watersheds. And that uh, without consulting any of the communities around the lake, and without you know, been any um, part of the planning, any part of the decision-making or any consultation, the communities were left out. And that construction of the dams, I think it was, especially with the Ogoki Reservoir that flooded our lake, that caused our lake to rise and our coffins and our cemetery, and particularly in our community uh, and our shoreline to erode. And uh, what that video doesn't show is that the, the, why, how this all started and came to be. And, um, so Ontario Power Generation, how they came in play is that's their predecessors that kind of did that. Um, so we we looked at the uh, chief king, chief and council at the time, wanted to reconcile with that. If that they didn't, you know, they wanted to um, deal with the past, and uh, otherwise that you know if this drags on, it's just going to be ugly, and you're not we're not going to heal, you know. Um, so they had uh, negotiations, and then part of that negotiations was a settlement, and part of that was uh, rebuilding that relationship, strengthening it. You know, it was a severed relationship. So, and uh, part of that discussion was okay. We didn't want to be on fossil fuels. We didn't want to be on dirty diesel. We want to be off of it. That wasn't our decision to in the beginning. And if it was, we wouldn't pick diesel. Um, so we looked at. Uh, they looked at several different options and because Gold Bay is one of the four communities in the northwestern Ontario in the north here that are deemed non-economical to, to cook up to the provincial grid, we had to look at uh, alternative technologies, innovative ways to get off diesel. And that's when they, they looked at, you know, uh, run of the river, uh, looked at, you know, uh, wind. There was no wind index really, but solar seemed good. And the buy-in from the community too was good. We was a heavily uh, community-driven process. We did a lot of community engagements, information sessions, and uh, uh, you know we approved. Then we got some funding, uh, and and constructed in 2018. That's when Melina and Power to the People came in and did the episodes, and it was a lot of fun. And I think what the opportunities as well in these projects is is it brings some excitement, brings some gatherings, brings us together in these uh, phases of the project. And in August of 16, we, the 1,020 solar panels, the battery building, the e-house, they were all connected and we turned off the diesel generators for the first time in the community and run their community 100% on clean solar power. And as of, you know, I think last week I checked the numbers in the e-house, we have offset over 300,000 liters of diesel fuel. Uh, to our community. Um, so that's a big game changer for us. We certainly feel good about that. Um, but to safe to say, uh, since then, uh, we've been having issues. And part of that reconciliation journey is not, you know, OPG to say, okay, that's it, but also stay close, stay in that relationship. And these issues will work together to resolve them. Don't just leave us. And I also want to mention that. Um, that when we were negotiating or when chief and council were negotiating, um, OPG was saying, okay, how would we, uh, what 
about, you know, we'll, we'll do this project together, but in we'll own, you know, a hundred percent of it. And then we'll hand it over in 20 years. Uh, and then Chief Gun said, no, no, we, that's not a good deal. Okay. How about 25% you own? We own 75% cheap. Wilford King said, no. Okay. 50, 50. Nope. He had to keep pushing. We want a hundred percent of that asset. Once it's, uh, once it's tested and proven and, um, and completed it, we want to that transferred over to Gold Bay First Nation. So that's part of that just, I, I believe, you know, we are part of the decision makers in our territory. We should be part of that economic uh, reconciliation, part of that economic engines in our own territory. And that can, you know, striking us from poverty. Uh, it's been far too long since our waters, our reservoirs, our resources have been used for megawatts of power or for um, revenue for the province or Canada. You know, and it leaves us out of that, um, you know, process. So, I also wanted to mention that. So I, uh, uh, that it, now I think that's good. I think that might be five or seven minutes. But uh, I really appreciate sharing the story and 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 the invitation to speak. Um, and thank you, Miigwech. <clears throat> Let's continue, Jay. AJ, is there like is there a definition of what an integrated remote renewable energy storage microgrid is? That's a long word. It is a long. Yeah. It you know <laughs> not even a word. Yeah, it is. And you know, I was trying to like, what is, you know, how should we just call it an acronym or something like that? Um, what it is, it's it's in it because it's the first of its kind in a remote, unconnected community. It's pairing up the diesel generators with a battery energy storage system, lithium ions, and a microgrid controller and a renewable technology. For us, it's solar um, to offset that diesel. So it's the diesel site and the, and, the, and the solar and battery energy storage working together. It's integrated, fully integrated and fully automated uh, so that when the sun is shining, those solar or those battery or the solar panels collect that solar energy, fill up those battery storage, uh, and then it once it reaches a certain set point, it turns the generators off and runs the whole community on solar power. Um, so we get about eight to ten hours, you know, or average nine hours on a really sunny day of just diesel off, clean solar. But at nighttime, we got to go back to solar. So our goal is to continue that goal of getting off fossil fuels. Um, part of that is, is looking at uh, getting grid connected too. Um, so because we've been, you know, our lake has been producing megawatts of power for the province. We're one out of four communities that will never be hooked up. Why is that? That is also unjust, you know, so. Thank you. Thank you again. And when you say it runs a community, like people's like residential homes and. Yeah, everything that the community is uh, like, that's the only energy source was the diesel generators since the 1960s up until 2019 that's when we got solar so everything was running on diesel since that time now we get to run on solar and you know so everything it's amazing it's amazing thank you so much for sharing that you got you. thank you for sharing with all of us so we're going to move on to um saya saya we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna play your video first and then we'll let you share that experience with us, please. There's three hydro projects in your territory, but one of them is more like the actual legacy. Yeah, the wonderful Finner Creek Hydro Project. It's a, the legacy project that really demonstrates sustainable uh, use and energy. Awesome. Yeah, let's go see okay. it. We work with other hatcheries to make sure that they're resourced to handle rivers that we're not active in. We have a land use plan that brings clean water to them. We're taking responsibility for stewarding our rivers. Oh yes, yeah, so there it is. This is uh, New Creek Hydro. So here we are, this is our power generation plan. We own 100%. 100%. Yeah, it's like, time to spread those wings and do it on our own. Yeah. Could you describe for me what the principles are for your nation of having a low impact on your homeland? Green energy and low footprint is, is the mantra. And, you know, we're only working with the water that's in the top 100 feet of the, of the mountain. And the water temperature is not changed from the top to the bottom. Amazing. And it goes back in. There's a waterfall that salmon can't jump up. 
Okay. And so we know that we're working in an area that is salmon free. This tail race is empty right now. The water would be flowing through here and down there, and then, then we'd be pouring it right back in like the waterfall that you hear over there. That's the fish barrier is that waterfall. And this is naturally occurring back into the, the mm -hmm. flow. Okay, mm -hmm. nice. So this is producing how much energy? This provides five megawatts of, uh, of energy. That's, That's a lot. It is, it's enough for 2,000 homes. You cool it to Fino and then house it in our villages of Opitsit and all those villages are going on green energy from our three projects, bringing the electricity to where we're consuming it. Yeah, it's such a great model your community's doing. Some great Invested things in. will come out of it, that's yeah. for sure. Well, thanks for showing me this. Yeah, uh, great, hello. <clears throat> uh, thanks for uh, sharing that video and thanks for inviting me here to share with story uh, in our pursuit of uh, green energy. Uh, very proud uh, projects for Tlaukwit to, to think that in the wintertime when rain is falling that uh, the whole region and all the outlying villages are operating not on fossil fuel energy. They're operating on uh, electricity that comes from our, our three uh, runner river projects. Um, these are much different than damming up an entire watershed um, we're talking about uh, water that passes between two rocks, the width of your desk and, and the top, and um, that's put in a pipe and run down the river on a steep terrain. It's using the terrain uh, of the West Coast, steep mountainous terrain, and when it gets to the bottom, it kind of gets funneled into a little laser beam to spin a wheel and generate electricity, and then it gets put into a tail race that gets put into the creek and the creek that it gets put back into is as wide as a as a highway, you know, like we're we're really talking about a tributary to a larger river. Um, we're operating above fish habitat. Um, we did every effort to bury the pipe in the ground, uh, to to not obstruct wildlife corridors. Um, as a First Nation developer, we didn't uh, build a logging road up the mountain. We used a little goat trail and left a lot of old growth trees standing. Um, we built it with much different principles than other people would. Um, and I'm not saying that every nation needs to um, develop the, these projects. It works for Tlaokwit. We live in a rainforest with steep terrain, which lends itself to this type of energy. Um, we chose to be a developer, but we could also just choose to collect um you know royalty from someone else that would develop it um but then as the first nation you would weigh those impacts on your territory and and i think what i'm just what i'm sharing is, is there a way there is a way to push the developer to make these green uh, to operate above fish habitat to to have the smallest footprint as possible and also to make sure that um companies that develop their territory have a relationship to the indigenous peoples who, who whose mountains they would uh, be operating in. Um, there's just so so much good that we feel about this. When you go up uh, to the top of the mountain, it's still serene. It's still a peaceful place to go. Uh, our, our bathing pools are still intact. We're not allowed to take all the water from the top the top of the mountain. Our water always has to be flowing through. And at the after the first hundred meters where our where our berm is. Um, the rain that falls below that is still falling into the creek. It we're only harnessing the 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 rain that catches. It's like the top of the mountain is a glove catching the rain, and that's what we're funneling into a pipe and making electricity. Um, we built three of them, each one of them uh, uh, giving enough energy for a, a couple thousand homes, and that makes up a lot of the region at the end of this power grid out here. And uh, we're really happy to share the story. It was it was difficult to pull, you know, literally forty five million dollars, fifteen million dollars a project to pull that together to invest your nation's uh, monies into these projects or find ways to do that, um, create partnerships to do it, and then over time pay out partnerships. So um, that's a very very quick uh, summary of, of where we've been, and um, yeah, I just want to highlight hi highlight the difference between our small projects versus big dams. And uh, yeah, happy to share our story. And thank you for inviting us. Thanks, Saya. Yeah, um, thank you for making the differentiation, which we also did in the guide for folks that are watching that we do not consider um, mega dams clean or green and that they mm -hmm. have, actually have a far more 
intense footprint in actually methane GHG emissions versus a run of the river system, which is a small scale to medium scale type of project, mm -hmm. which actually works with the landscape and the geography of the communities, like Saya yeah. was saying in so-called BC, where there's a mountainous terrain. So that's why they exist. I also mm -hmm. wanted to say, Saya, because um, visiting your community, you guys are doing not only the three um, run of the rivers, but also there's geo exchange, district energy, heating your homes. And I was able to visit the homes in Tiloquiet. Um, So I just wanted to mention for folks that um, if you want to watch, I just put the the pro, the um, episode in the chat. And so if you want to watch all of the things that Tuluk is doing, and Sai has just been so gracious to give us um, your time because you you also work on tribal parks and you're just a, such a busy person protecting your homelands. Mm -hmm. We just are so thankful that everyone, including yourself, is here today because you guys are so busy. But um, Jamie, I just wanted to pass it to you, but I wanted to mention that there's other um, types of energy systems mm -hmm. that um, to look what it's using if Saya pass it back to you yeah just um yeah thanks for that uh uh acknowledgement you know we were lobbying against site c actively as a nation and as economic development corp and literally the province is investing billions into one detrimental project instead of spending billions changing the grid bringing the grid to some of these remote rivers where first nations would be able to develop and benefit themselves um, small proprietors or small nations could have been benefiting if they invested the grid system to get to some of these remote locations. Some of our greenest energy is tied up so far away from the grid that it's not feasible, but they chose to invest billions in Site C instead of, and we were lobbying hard against that. And now the province is saying, boy, we don't have enough green energy. And now they're looking at reopening uh, a call for more green energy. And um, yeah, thanks for the great work you, you're doing today. Let go. <clears throat> Thank you, Saya. All right, Troy. We're moving over to Troy and with the uh the Big Mound wind farm. It's so big. So how long have you both worked here for? Uh, about two and a half Great. years. And what did you do before for work? I worked in uh, on diesel mechanics, motors, and stuff like that before, but then I went into the electrical field. So you basically transitioned from a non-renewable energy field to a renewable energy field. Yes. Before. That's so cool. And you came from? Uh, I used to work in forestry. I did about five years in forestry. Oh, man. Painted in a cell. Uh, right now, we're going to be working on this cabinet. Oh. Um, we're actually going to be replacing a Bachman module, which is uh, essentially the brain of the turbine, so we can get communication with the turbine. So brain surgery, essentially. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, the reason why we replaced this module is because there was no communication from the computer to the turbine, mm -hmm. so that's how we knew it was something to do with the module. So you're like wind doctors, essentially. So you have to make prognosis and then fix it. My favorite thing about being up here is, is the view. If you take a look around, like it's amazing. Like you, you can see so far. We're 100 meters in the air right now. We always learn new things every day. What you do every day, it's pretty amazing to see the capacity or high level of skills that you're bringing to your nation. It's a you must be pretty proud. Thank you. Yeah, so our uh, our project Meskikukchus and just uh, very simply Big Wind. Uh, when we were sitting with the chiefs, uh, trying to give it a name, one of the chiefs just you know said just said Meskikukchus, and it was kind of a natural uh, thing. Uh, so it's 150 megawatts. It's a uh, you know large size project. Uh, where we started off was the uh, the. Quebec government had a plan to put, you know, like I said in the, uh, the intro there, about 40% of their total wind uh, farm, wind energy projects going to be in our territory. And of course, their uh, plan for discussing that with the Mi'kmaq was zero. Uh, they had very little intention to deal with indigenous, uh, you know, indigenous rights, indigenous people. And we didn't really want to stop the uh, projects from coming on our territory either. You know, we, we've seen the benefit of, um, the future of green energy. Uh, if they were going to put it in our territory, you know, we felt, you know, we felt, you know, mixed feelings. Um, it's going to happen without us, but at the same time, it's going to help offset, you know, other, other kind of uh, energy. So 
uh, the communities were letting it go forward. Uh, they did bid on the, uh, to have a project for themselves, but they were never successful. And then they started planting these projects on our territory and, you know, uh, excluding us. And at the time, what we did is we went to the chiefs and we said, chiefs, you know, we need to do something about this. Um, so we did uh, put our gears in motion. Um, we studied what Quebec was doing. Uh, we looked at their plans. We looked at different projects. We got to know the players in the industry. Uh, the developers, you know, we knew they were spending big bucks. Um, you know, each of the project uh, developers were getting well over five, six, seven, eight hundred megawatts of wind farm development. So, you know, one developer was building six wind farms in the first uh, tranche. The second tranche, you know, there was again building four, five, six hundred megawatts at a time uh, through projects that are, you know, the first projects were 100 megawatt projects, 109.5. Uh, the next bunch were 150. And then finally, the government came out and they said, okay, we're going to have some indigenous projects uh, in Quebec. And what they said is that the maximum will be 25 megawatts per community or 50 megawatts per nation. Uh, when we looked at that, we said, oh, nice recipe for failure. Uh, the big developers need, you know, five, 600, 800 megawatts for them to be successful. And we're going to be stuck with your 25 uh, for one community or 50 for the nation. So, uh, we we totally uh, set that aside. They asked us to bid. They called us up on the phone. Make sure your bid today is the last day. And we told them, no, we are not going to be participating in your program. Um, what we're looking for is a true accommodation. We want, you know, <laughs> just transition. We wanted to make sure that the size of our project was reflective of the other sides of the projects. And we wanted to make sure that the accommodation measure, the term that we're using, um, the uh, our share is going to be you know large enough that we're going to have good profits and we're going to be able to fund the programs in our community so um we targeted you know kind of a 200 million dollar revenue over a 20-year period uh, that looked like somewhere between 100 and 200 megawatts um we looked at the territory that we had so we had test towers up on our territory for a number of years and uh, we brought the three communities under the umbrella of the Migway maui secretariat and you know we just kept moving forward and we kept getting stronger and stronger our arguments kept getting tighter and tighter and our target came clearer and clearer so we went to the um to the premier deputy premier and we went to the developers the presidents and the ceos and we said you know you guys have a big problem you have a number of power purchase agreements on our territory and no one has anything no one has done anything to consult us let alone accommodate our interests and we said, we find a grand true, a big hole in your power purchase agreement, and we're going to blast through one of those. So we told them, we're going to find the biggest project or the smallest project, the one that has the best financing, the one that has the least financing. Um, but consider yourselves as a target, and we're targeting you, and we're going to knock your project down. Unless we're there and we have a share of, you know, of this wind energy and the, the money's going to hand, land in our hands and we're going to create more programs in our community. So finally, the, they, you know, they came to see the light. They came to see that the Mi'kmaq were very, how would they say it, forthright. Uh, they knew what their vision was. They knew where they were going. They knew how they were going to get there. And only then did we invite developers to come with us. So the best part of our project is, is that uh, when we built it, we were right there at the forefront and the center of the project all the way through. Uh, we were there to determine who was going to finance our project. We were there who's going to be the uh, supply to turbines, who's going to do the construction of it. And uh, by being so, how would I say it, having a vision for a long time, we trained our people and we certified our people to do the construction of the project three, four years in advance before the project started construction. So typically a, a project of 150 megawatts, a wind power project, you would see about 300, mig, uh, 300 workers on that project. So in our head, we said, okay, we want 100 Mi'kmaq workers to be on, working on this project. And uh, by the work that we did uh, with our team, uh, we applied to governments, we got money for training, we applied to the uh, Quebec Construction Commission, and we got our people certified. Our people have been always doing ironworks in Boston, Calgary, New York City, uh, but they couldn't work in the province of Quebec because they didn't have the proper certification. Well, we changed that, and we got all our people that were qualified already certified, and then they came to work uh, as well. So. Uh, the vision we had at the time was that my mom built that or my dad works there. So you see a couple of Mi'kmaq workers there in the video. Unfortunately, right now, the Mi'kmaq are finding a lot better, more lucrative jobs uh, elsewhere, uh, either, you know, either because it's tax-free 
or um, you know just doing other trades in other places, getting getting better pay. But we don't have any Mi'kmaq workers there now, unfortunately. But you know they are available, and I think the um, the biggest takeaway for us was that we need to you know see the development of renewables happen but we need to be at the forefront and making the idea of how that's going to happen we need to have a clear vision uh, we need to put our people first we need to put the environment first uh, i should mention that when we did the uh, consultation of our own project the developer that was with us we told him we're not going to do it the way quebec's doing it quebec is going to say we need to go through these steps we're going to take extra steps and we're going to make sure our people are more included uh, at the end there was two uh, major things that we were looking at the medicine. So we did, you know, we went on a territory where there was, and we didn't find any medicines that were unique or some that, you know, were just there. You know, we found that the medicines that were found where we were going to do our construction were, were all over the territory. And the next thing was the moose. Uh, our people are, you know, avid moose hunters. A lot of people eat moose as one, you know, one of their primary meals. And people were saying, well, what's going to happen to the moose? So we did some studies uh, before, during, and even after we followed the moose to see what was happening. And we were lucky, uh, you know, with the work that we did, that the moose is still there, you know. When you cut a bunch of trees down, the new shoots that come up, the moose like that, they go, you know, they continue, they come back where the, the wind farm is. And the neigh or the wind or the noise um, from the turbines turning and the wind, it doesn't affect them, doesn't spook them. So, um, yeah, I think the, um, the, the benefit for us uh, will be seen over the longer period of time. Uh, we're there, we're included, um, and the Quebec government recently um, awarded an additional 100 megawatts to our project. So our project's going to go to 200 meg 250 megawatts. So it's beautiful that that happened. And I've seen recently that Quebec government is, you know, kind of saying they have a new plan going forward uh, for uh, renewable energy. They're looking at, you know, hydro dams, of course, across Quebec but trying to include Indigenous people and being owners of these projects. So I think that um, as we go forward, we know we need to um, listen to what Quebec is saying, but at the same time, speak to our people, um, find out where we want to be, what that looks like. And whenever we find out what we want to do, push hard and don't stop. You know, we've got to hit and hit and hit. It took us 10 years. But the only reason why we were successful at the end is we never gave up and we knew that this was ours. We, you know, we made it happen. We made it happen for our people. So uh, thanks, everyone. I, uh, I'm honored to be here today. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. So for this section, we have one more speaker and one more video. Uh, we're getting closer to that question and answer period and the draw. So let's, uh, our final speaker for today is going to be Ms. Serena. <laughs> Take it away, Serena. Oh, video first, I'm sorry. This is right beside a decommissioned coal energy power plant, and now we're seeing solar being erected in its place. How do you feel about that? What's the story behind that? Ontario Power Generation uh, decommissioned Nanocoke Generating Station in 2013, and now Nanocoke Solar... Hey. into that greener energy. Even though we see a refinery in the background still pumping oil, I think we see this is like really the energy transition that we're all really hoping for. And I think it's pretty inspiring that Six Nations is a part of it. Yeah, amazing. Um, I'm really grateful to come from Six Nations and I just wanna give a shout out before I get started to Tabitha Curley, who you saw in that video, she was actually my mentor who got me into the Development Corporation and got me into starting to think about clean energy work um, in our community. So yeah, Six Nations is the largest First Nation community in so-called Canada. We are a Haudenosaunee community, very proud to be Haudenosaunee. And we live along the Grand River, which was affirmed lands within our beaver hunting grounds through the Haldeman Track, which we were affirmed to be able to prosper. Unfortunately, through... Um, being in the place we are, we're about an hour away from Toronto, <laughs> we actually only have 5% remaining of our territory. Um, and actually this summer in the 2020 Catalyst program, they have a map of the grid system all throughout so-called Canada. And I was showing my community and it's completely concentrated. My community was the, probably the most community that had the most uh, transmission lines, distribution, all of it. 
Um, so we're completely surrounded by colonization. We have mega dams, over 30 dams on our river. We have mass housing development. We are completely surrounded by mass agriculture. A lot of impacts we're facing currently in our community. And this is really evident growing up on the Great Lakes um, since the Grand River, actually the mouth of the Grand River goes into Lake Erie. It was really evident growing up on the Great Lakes about half an hour away with the Nanacoke Generating Station, which was a coal plant. And it was half an hour from my community. So the Nanacoke Generating Station, it was actually located on the North shore of Lake Erie in Haldeman County. And it was owned by Ontario Power Generation, which you heard from AJ, a Crown Corporation. The operation started in 1972. It was operating from 1972 to 2013, and it was the largest coal-fired power plant in North America, delivering up to 2,760 megawatts of power. And it was actually one of the top 10 of Canada's uh, single sources of greenhouse emissions. It was also Ontario's single largest source of nitrogen oxides and mercury that caused smog, as well as other pollutants. And um, the Ontario Medical Association actually said that the air pollution was a public health, health crisis that was coming because it was killing over 6,000 people a year in Ontario. So originally it was uh, scheduled to be decommissioned in 2009, but obviously um, with how the government works, things get delayed and it didn't get decommissioned till 2013. So after 2013 um, and Kathleen Wynne being in uh, government, changing that to decommission coal throughout the province, we actually started to see that change within my own community. And in 2015, uh, through We Gather Our Voice as a community engagement that took place over six months, my community decided that they wanted to separate business and politics. So that's where the Development Corporation, Six Nations of the Grand River Development Corporation came in. And shortly after that, they began their journey into clean energy and began implementing an array of solar a few years later, Six Nations of the Grand River actually implemented on the site of the former coal plant a 44 megawatt solar project that began operation in 2019. So that's where Melina was visiting with her power to the people in partnership now with Ontario Power Generation and Mississaugas of the credit. Anyone knows who Six Nations knows, um, there's definitely conflict between us and the saga. So seeing us be able to get into partnership is really amazing. Um, from there now though, and today I can talk to you that Six Nations has a green energy portfolio of producing over a thousand megawatts of clean energy through the involvement in over 18 solar or wind projects uh, that we are either directly within with equity interest or indirectly through community benefit agreements. And so with all this funds, we have millions of dollars coming into my community now, they decided to create the Economic Development Trust, which was a trust, an application-based community investment trust available for community members, both grassroots and corporate, to apply to be able to benefit the community. We were seeing our language school, uh, we were seeing two row on the grand of canoe trip to the fire station and getting fire trucks. So all the surplus profits from our projects were now being generated back into the community and invested into the collective benefit of our members. So going back to Ontario Power Generation and the partnerships, I really think there's a lot to learn from Six Nations and, and a lot to learn from even in Ontario and the landscape that we're currently within, because I really believe Six Nations partnerships we currently hold with Hydro One, uh, with Ontario Power Generation, Samsung, Grant Renewable Energy, like we have a multitude. We're currently with Enerstore and Northland Power for a 250 megawatt energy storage project. And... Uh, it sets a precedent for the rest of the country and governments that what they should be doing and how they should be engaging with First Nations and how that we should be equity owners within the projects that are on our territories. Just as we see like Alberta right now, who has a moratorium on development, on renewable energy development, where then you see Six Nations engaging in multiple different large utility scale projects. And so with all of that being said, I'm very proud to come from my community and and to know that they are leading the transition with the largest clean energy portfolio out of any First Nation in Canada. I actually was working in there when I was around 18 years old and I was working on the Niagara reinforcement line doing community engagement, public education. And that's how I got involved with the Dev Corp, got involved um, really on understanding projects on a large scale. And since I worked in community engagement, everyone knows who works in community engagement, it's rough out there. And while working, I was the one listening to the community. And unfortunately, my community actually wasn't really engaged in the projects itself. And they really didn't know much about them. So understanding that there was now gaps in community engagement, consent, this led me on my whole journey now over the last five, six years to really see what is a just transition and what can that look like in a community of 28,000 members. 
And I have to recognize that I'm extremely privileged today to be able to even say that I come from a community that is within the transition, right? There's communities that are just fighting with the utility, with the regular to even get projects on the grid. Whereas now I come from this privileged perspective that I can look at the gaps within the transition itself so we can learn to do better. And I always am a fair, uh, firm believer in how do we make good things better, right? Because we are within the transition, but to make it truly dress, just, we need to really acknowledge the gaps that are still there. Where are the youth? Where's the community? Where's the hereditary governance? How many people are being employed by these jobs, right? And right now there's an urgency and necessity for indigenous led climate solutions grounded in self-determination, healing, reconciliation, and community governance to make sure that this transition to clean energy is just and does not replicate the same inequities of the fossil fuel industry, such as not being consulted, having the coal power plant on our territory without anything to say. So with all that being said, it really led me to find Melina and work at Sacred Earth Solar and, and look understand that Sacred Earth Solar works within the gaps that I was seeing within my own community and within the transition of my community, making sure that the transition is accessible to those most impacted from environmental degradation and climate change. So Sacred Earth Solar, when Indigenous women-led organization focused on empowering those on the front lines with climate solutions and healing justice, and not only on the front lines of land defense, but as well as those on the front lines of healing and cultural re revitalization or protection in the community. We really focus on this education to implementation framework. So how do we get education? How do we provide literacy? But also then how do we put that into action? Right? So as I mentioned before, our programs, we do focus on climate and clean energy solutions. And with that being said, we focus on these small scale projects that are directly with community partners who are also leading the projects. We just really act as a resource and we really work with them to secure energy security and sovereignty. I'm lucky enough to say that I'm currently working on two solar projects within my own community of Six Nations. One that will be with No More Silence, an MMIW Toronto based group who is building a healing lodge on Six Nations. And another with my own longhouse, Sour Springs Longhouse, uh, the longhouse of our hereditary system, the Cuyuga peoples. And so with Sacred Earth Solar, I've been able to really focus on what does a community led solution look like and how can I see real benefits that will actually, my community will see firsthand so that they can support maybe these large scale projects eventually. But first they really need to see the benefits themselves. And so, yeah, the to be able to work on the No More Silence project, for example, the No More Science Project is a sweat lodge, an accessible sweat lodge that is there for um, peoples with disabilities as well as the 2S LGBTQ plus communities who have actually been left out of ceremony historically and to provide that accessible and safe space for them. And I, we're providing electricity in their bunkie so they'll have a pre and post place to be before ceremony and as well as a hot tub and a pool for therapy, right? And right there, I can see the impact firsthand. Sour Springs Longhouse, we're going to be doing a food security building, building a seed storage facility, as well as energy efficient upgrades and a solar PVU system. My community will see the impact firsthand. When they're doing ceremony, they'll know that those lights come on because of the sun, our brother, the sun. So with all of this being said, I think it really picks on this big conversation of that we, there have been groups that have been left out of this conversation. And even though we are within the transition, we still need to acknowledge that, is it still accessible and how can we actually make this just? And I don't think many of these communities, especially the ones with Sacred or Solar, have been given the opportunity to be in this clean energy conversation. So I think that's why the Just Transition Guide is so important because the Just Transition Guide was created by and for communities as a resource to support our peoples through this transition, to make it accessible, to make knowledge there, and to make sure that they feel like they can implement their ideas and they have a support system and a community. In the guide, we address many nuances. We address the renewable energy solutions, and we don't we, we believe that one size does not fit all and it might not work for your community, but we provide the space to have these conversations because we're in the transition now and now we need to be really filling those gaps. And so I believe the Just Transition Guide is a critical resource for everyone, indigenous communities and non-indigenous peoples to provide a different sense forward of a future without fossil fuel extraction. And uh, yeah, I just am really grateful that we provide this educational resource for communities so that people like me, a young person like me who is 25 years old can go out and do these projects. And it may be in an unconventional an unconventional way, but I, I just think it's really powerful. And I'm really grateful to Sacred or Solar that I get to do the work I wanna see in my community. Thank you. Thank you, Serena. Hey, hi. So we're gonna go into some some comments, some 
I don't want to say final remarks, but Serena, um, Malina is going to be sharing some information about the Just Transition Guide, but I just wanted to give a big thank you to our community members here today, Troy, AJ, Serena, Melina, and Saya. Thank you so much for sharing the work that you're doing in your communities and really enforcing uh, Melina's opening statement of how Indigenous communities are leading the way in just transition to alternative energy sources. Thank you in protecting our, our, our lands and our, and our Mother Earth. I'll pass it over to you, Serena, Melina. Hi, hi, thank you. Um, wow, I'm just so excited to have the privilege of bringing all these amazing speakers together, community leaders, leaders in their community and across this country. Um, thank you to Troy, Saya, AJ, and Serena for sharing your community stories to give like an in-depth look what's happening on the ground because a lot of times we just don't see enough of that. We see the doom and gloom, but we don't see the amazing action that communities are doing across Turtle Island. And I think you're truly inspirations to me and all and the privilege people have like, you know, everyone that knows you just like we you're such inspiration. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. And I'm just even sharing with power to the people to so we could even uplift your story and to continue this relationship years later. Um, and just, you know, from people that are watching now, just know that the guide is an offering and a resource for Indigenous peoples who are looking for pathways to implementation, actual implementation. We've had enough talk and we need to see implementation. So it contains valuable success stories, real life examples, and important technical information to start your journey, which together outlines the ways communities can move forward through a just transition. Our guide has seven main sections. I know it's overwhelming sometimes to open up a 180 page document, but there's seven sections where you can go through and learn about the energy grid, electricity, landscape, transmission, distribution, energy efficiency, energy conservation, and also what the different types of energy are, the good, the bad, and the ugly, we call that section. So the solar, the wind, the run of the river, the geo exchange, the district energy, the microgrid, the mixed use energy, and then also critically looking at lithium mining, mega dams, nuclear SMRs, which we do not consider clean, but we also cover beyond energy solutions. We cover eco housing, food security initiatives, and cultural revitalization. Check out the episode of Kanaka Bar where they've they've been doing this, or Bella Kula. We've the episode on that because. It's so important to know all of these all come together. Like Serena said, there's not a one size fits all. So also from my master's thesis of how I implemented, I have a step-by-step -step case study of how I implemented the things that took into consideration, which you heard today from every one of the speakers have all the different steps. It can be overwhelming, but these are steps and there's a case study from my master's. And then we have key lessons at the front of the guide and policy recommendations at the back, which are all so like solution, a solutions-based approach from communities to, to show what's happening on the ground. Because as our world transitions to renewable energy from fossil fuels, it is also critical that we are aware of the impacts of quote, clean energy. And we do not continue to replicate the same systems of harms that have been perpetuated from the previous energy era. So I think that's why it's important to really have that critical analysis where we can reduce the harm, like Saya was saying, like, and, and Troy was saying, do above and beyond of what is um, even expected um, across the board. And we know that because we love our homelands. So we do everything to protect our homelands. A big shout out to Hoodwinked in the Hot House. So if you want to learn more about false solutions, um, you can um, explore that, which is a good complement for um, the Just Transition Guide, because the Just Transition Guide is talking about solutions, but we also need to know about false solutions that are kind of being purported and out in the media, out in other places. Um, so, you know, when I started, as I mentioned earlier, when I started my Just Transition journey in 2011, what actually happened was there was a massive oil spill on my homeland in my community, and my family was being poisoned, 4.5 million liters spilled across our territory my cook my my auntie and um all different people were texting me and saying um we can't uh, we can't breathe our eyes were burning um and so it was like a harsh reality to realize i was already working on climate issues and yet i couldn't stop i was forced to watch a harmful extractive industry poison my community and i couldn't do anything to stop it so 
it was really traumatizing and terrifying. And so what I realized then 10, like tw in 2011, I needed to start building solutions because all around my territory and many territories in the Alberta tar sands, we don't have a choice. We're economic hostages. And so what is the yes to a no when our communities are um, and homelands are being pillaged? How do we look at just transition and how do we start the implementation? And I realized then that there was no how-to guide, as I mentioned, teaching through trial and error and getting the first project up. So this literally, this guide is an offering back to even my younger self and to all people that are listening and all people that will come across it in the years to come. I really hope it helps people start the implementation journey to really make our communities resilient in the face of climate change. Because if we don't start the action on the ground, we're not going to be resilient enough in the face of all the climate crises we see happening across Turtle Island and around the world. We need to be implementing and enough talking, enough talking at the UNFCCC, enough talking about all the places, all the legislation that's not helping communities on the ground. We need to see climate solutions now and we need to um, really bring our communities along. So I really hope that the Just Transition helps communities, workers, all people that are looking for that transition um, into a, a new era. And so this is the, so just to end, the Just Transition Guide is the how. Um, it is focusing on how communities can be a part of this transition, how workers are going to be a part of this transition without leaving anyone behind. So this guide is about making communities resilient. So hi, hi, thank you. Okay, let's go to Melinda. So we're going into our question and answer period. Um, we have one question so far, and I think what we'll do here is I'll read the question aloud and maybe anyone from the panel, um, if you just want maybe raise your hand or unmute yourself and answer the questions as we go. If not, <laughs> I'll try my best. Um, so the first question, have you folks faced any backlash or disagreement from community members who are not convinced an energy transition is needed? I see Saya. No, not at all. Uh, yeah, not many climate deniers in Indigenous communities. Um, people get it. We're often bearing the impacts of climate change. And uh, uh, I, I thought it was pretty easy uh, to, to explain to them the interest of, of not burning fossil fuels. Um, but that may be different in other parts of Canada. There's a second part to the question. I guess I, I should have read this part as well because I just made a yes or no. But thank you for elaborating. How do we convince the persistent doubters that the social environmental gains of decarburization are more important than protecting certain jobs, industries, historic ways of doing things? Yeah, jobs and livelihoods are, are a tough one. Um, yeah, I know we, we, face, we face that, you know, with... At home, we have to decide between fish farms and possibly moving fish farms out, but there's people that work at them. And so trying to explain the, the seven generations are, are more important. And the work we do is to be felt by our grandchildren. The work that I'm doing isn't even going to benefit me. It's, go, it's for the future and hopefully that we can convince community to stand together. Thank I, you. I got to just to add on that. I think, you know what, um, these last few summers, especially, you, you can't ignore the forest fires and the, that's ripping through our country and, and all over and Greece and all over, all over the world. Um, the weather formations, the new species that are coming into territories. But then again, you're going to have people that are just not going to believe it anyways. You know, so you just we got to keep talking about it, keep sharing. And, um, you know, it's just going to be the way it is. I think we're seeing a growing and our catalysts, our, 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 our champions in our community, our people are growing stronger. They're getting educated. They're going up there in the front line. So I think we can have uh, faith and, and trust and, and love that that is, is going to happen as well. So, Bruce, thank you so much. Next question. Creating these just transitions endeavors, 
what is one thing we need to keep in mind as we embark on this work with our communities, our band offices, the regulatory and funding regimes, et cetera? Everyone's just real humble. They don't want to interrupt, but does anybody want to go first? Troy, I see you're off mute. Yeah, just make a comment on the, uh, the band council side. Uh, our counselors and our chiefs are quite busy usually. Uh, they have a hard time to keep, keep up and to do, you know, do things on a regular day. But then we want them to go out and take on this extra initiative. It's sometimes hard work. I think that whatever we could do to help, uh, you know, in your community, help them help educate them it would help them uh, work with you um but don't just expect you know to uh knock on the chief's door or the counselor's door and that they're gonna be like okay let's do this um yeah, like i said they're quite busy but uh, you know bring part of the solution with you when you go into the door and see them and uh, work with them uh, if you can get on the yeah you know if you can get on the council uh, agenda that would be great uh, and bring forward you know bring forward a positive vision, bring forward a positive idea. Uh, but I would say, you know, don't give up on them. Uh, continue to work with them. Uh, think of it as a, uh, a journey or a relationship you're going to build with them, as opposed to going there and ask them, hey, you want to be there and expect them to jump on right away. Expect, you know, that they'd be like, well, we're not sure. We don't know what to do. How are we going to do this? Expect it to be more of a journey than, than an answer yes to them. I'll build off of that um, from Troy, because I really liked what you said. And I think at the core of it is relationships. And I don't think a lot of people really understand that the project isn't going to be done. There's not just one person involved in a project, man. It is like a, an array of a whole team. And how do you make sure that then your community is within that array, right? And their voices are within that. And so for me, the one thing I would say is that capacity building. Like I, I come from a community Six Nations. Our community energy champion isn't even from the community. And so how are we building that within the young people so that we can build the capacity? Because just as Troy said, like our leadership, our different funders, like they're all very busy. I am currently working with the Longhouse. These people are doing our ceremonies. They're making our decisions. They're doing our funerals. They're, they're doing it all. And so what happens when you go to them with this idea, like, I want this now. Really, you have to come in, you have to come in with the capacity, you have to come in with the informed understandings, and you have to be like, I'm going to do this work, and I'm going to do it in a good way, and I'm going to put community at the forefront of that, but I'm going to build my skill set in myself and be that community energy champion, because sometimes projects aren't going to happen unless you're the one doing them, and so that, to me, was a really big understanding of, like, I just need to be that leader myself to go forth, and I'm going to need to be the person, and I, that's why I think community energy champions are so important because they're not necessarily the technical, they're not necessarily like the law, the legal. They're the person who is the connector, bringing everyone together so that they can create this community vision going forward. So really when I look at that, I think my big thing as a young person too is make sure you're putting that capacity in our young people. I felt like in Six Nations, I was one of the only young people that was even being engaged within this conversation. And we're gonna have, people are gonna retire soon. And we have what, a thousand megawatts of power left? Who is gonna be taking that over and who is gonna be maintaining that for our community? So just make sure education and capacity building are at the forefront and that this is in a, it's from indigenous leaders, right? I'm learning from Troy, I'm learning from AJ and Melina. Like I'm learning from people who have been doing the work so that I can go forth and do the work as well and make sure that I'm doing it in a good way with relationships at the forefront. Yeah, it really is about, um breaking down those silos and like building the bridges you are like as a, if you become a community energy champion, you really are breaking those silos that exist in our society that is kind of holding back how just transition can really flourish. So we need to be the bridge between the renewable energy sector, between climate organizations, between government policymakers, project financiers, utility, labor, engineer, the list goes on. So it, it's 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 a whole thing, but then you just get to meet more people. Like, I feel like I've gone so much like, you know, I was like very much in like, 
the EJCJ, like climate environmental justice movement for so long since I was like, you know, in my early 20s. And now I just know so many more people like doing this work with me in so many different silos and parts of society. And I'm just, I don't know, I, I really actually enjoy it. But you just have to kind of get over that shyness and just bring everyone along with you. And it really is about, Serena said, about bringing capacity to all parts of our community and playing climate bingo. We went and played climate bingo, energy literacy within communities with just in our in our community school and just teaching people like teaching the five-year-olds once the solar went up and they were like you could tell they were so interested there's huge panels now right beside the school and we went in each I went from grade kindergarten to grade 12 and the the grade fives as soon as like did anybody have any questions and they're just like how what happens at night around the solar like people you know there's so much thirst for energy literacy and climate literacy in our communities that we just gotta be those people to bring it into our nations Hi, hi. I don't know if anybody else wants to um, answer or I know there's a couple of more questions and we're coming up to the end of at 2.30, we, we finish this webinar, but we're going to do a draw first too. Sure. So. Just <clears throat> one more thing about, you know, major projects and all, any project needs a community champion. You're you're hearing from a lot of them. You, you, you can't underestimate that the need of that someone that's reporting to chief and council, updating your elders, going to community meeting and talking about it garnering more support and then that person is also and in, in even in all of our work through whether you're lobbying don't underestimate your first nation power to access the vp of some of a hydro corp or or a minister or a deputy minister write that letterhead for your council get them to sign it and then you're you're going to get front desk at a minister or deputy decision maker and then you need your task is to create a champion on the other side of the desk you need to go there articulate and they need to be as, as versed as you are and passionate as you are so that they're going up and saying, hey, there's a great project uh, I've heard. We really need to get behind this. So creating a champion on the other side of the desk is almost the tool I use on almost every file I work on. And um, yeah, just go, go, go. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, we have a few questions. I'm sorry to say we're probably not going to get to them all because of the draw. And we have about 16 minutes left. So here's, here's a question for you, though. Um, are there specific ways you hope settler-led ally organizations can uplift the Indigenous-led Just Transition mo movement at all, if at all? I mean, I'll just say share our stories. Know that we're leading this. And like do as much as you can to uplift the stories of communities to support the story the, to support the communities to finance the communities to um, build capacity to bring training to do anything you can to be a part that ally that like co-conspirator in the in the like bringing to fruition projects that bring food security that bring renewable energy that bring eco housing that bring all of the cultural resiliency it, it is a really about you know, even though I hate to use the term sometimes the reconciliation, because it, that's what actually reconciliation looks like on the ground to me when you're rebuilding, helping communities rebuild and revitalize. Anyone else? Yeah, I, I. Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, I was pushing it too many times. Uh, I like to see um, more Indigenous people sitting at the table when the utilities are doing anything. So I think that um, the, the settler-led uh, organizations, these big corporations uh, that are working in renewables, when they are going forward to talk to utility, <laughs> they should be saying, you know, where's the indigenous people here? Uh, before they go out and build a three, four, five hundred million dollar project, power purchase agreement, anything to do with that, they should be forcing the utility to have the indigenous people sitting at the table and, you know, that we should be sitting there uh, as decisions are taking place and we should be included in those decisions. So I think that they should really uh, push those utilities further than ever before. I think it's time that they uh, they start listening and they, we start owning that these utilities all around us. When we look at Hydro-Quebec, actually across Canada, the biggest development that's going to happen in renewables is probably going to be the upgrading of all these hydro dams right across our territory. You know, maybe some shouldn't be upgraded. Maybe some should be, you know, go back to spilling in, on the territory again. But I think that, uh, that that's one thing I'd like to see, that they should be forced utilities to have us there, be there. 
I just want to add to to uh, that. Those are all really awesome inputs. And, uh, you know, don't wait till last minute to build a relationship with the communities or coming in there. I think often what happens, they get a, you know, all uh, proposals due in a month and we should have an indigenous community attached to it. And then they come and reach out. Don't do that. Um, I think start building your relationships and getting to know, speak to the communities, ask them what they need. You know, they'll tell you. And if it's not the right time, don't be hurt. You know, there's a lot of things that are going on in the community that just that can handle only so much at a time. I think I feel bad sometimes when I say, you know, sorry, this is I don't think that we have the right time for this, you know, maybe later. And I feel bad for doing that, you know, because only I have only so much capacity to take on. Um, so those are just my thoughts, too, on that Indigenous ally or settler ally. I'll just give one last example because it just is the just transition guide in this launch in itself. And we work with the sustainable jobs working group of like a bunch of different organizations across the country. And they all came in to support us with this launch by amplifying the work of the just transition guide, using your resources, using your capacity, using your uh, uh, platforms, right? Like but at the core of what AJ and all of them just said, relationships within that, right? So not just being an extractive of like, oh, I want what you have and let's go forth. No, like, let's become friends first. Like, let's sit down for a cup of tea and then let's see how we can work together and push forward our shared vision for a just future. So yeah, I just want to like give a shout out because we saw it within real time with this launch of organization, settler led organization supporting us and making sure that this work is amplified across the country and further. Thank you, everyone. So in the spirit of settler allyship, uh, we're having a draw. And the draw was intended, sorry to say, for folks from Indigenous communities. So if uh, a non-Indigenous person does happen to win the draw, I ask you in the spirit of settler allyship to let those dollars go to, to our community folks today. We say sunyas. I don't know how everyone else says money in their language, but. So yeah, Jamie. We're coming up to the end. Um, I just want to say we're just so, so happy to, one, first release this Just, Trans Just Transition Guide and get this into the hands of so many people across Turtle Island and really around the world. In, um, learning from the inspiring stories of all the communities here today, from AJ, Troy, Saya, Serena, from my community, um, we really hope that it's beneficial to you, um, that you can read through it at your own time. Again, it's available for download for free on the Sacred Earth Solar website under sacredearth.solar slash just transition. You can find it there. Um, if you want to follow up with any of us, um, please let myself or Jamie know because we are in the registration Zoom. And I don't know, Jamie, if you want to say anything or we can pass it around for a couple of quick last minute words from all the the people. Yeah, let's open up to our relatives from the different nations and all the great work that they do. Any final remarks for everyone? I'll start from the Eastern door. Uh, <laughs> thanks everyone. And on behalf of all the Mi'kmaq, let's keep transitioning. Well, all in, well, all you Keep it going across. Yeah, and I'll go to all of you for attending and uh, thank you all for being so interested and like excited about the guide. I'm a, cr a contributor on the guide and it's been a lot of work to be able to do this. And we are so excited to be able to share this with you and hopefully empower and support those who want to implement their own solutions. Like feel free to contact us at Sacred Earth Solar. We're always open into building relationships, but yes, it's we need everyone in this transition. We need all of you. You all have a role and you all have a gift. And so I just want to put that out there. Just remember that and that we can all work together and hopefully create this shared just future. Yeah, miigwech. Thank you uh, for everyone that's tuning in. Don't give up. Um, you know, stay strong. Uh, feel free, if you have any questions after this, to uh, look me up. My, my email is energy at gbfn.ca. You can also go to the Gold Bay First Nation website and find my contact there. So if you have any questions that we didn't get a chance to answer, uh, feel free, reach out, please, miigwech. And Saya, last but not least on the BC coast. Oh yeah, Tleko, just uh, wishing you all the best on your endeavors and wish you success in, in any transition that you're, you're, you're endeavoring on. 
Let's go. Shoot. Shoot. Jamie, we did it. Two minutes to spare. That's amazing. <laughs> It Thank is, you for staying on. Jamie, any closing words or do you want me to say I, anything else? I think maybe one thing we can talk we can say is um we are going to be releasing more resources like this. We're looking at possibly revamping, not revamping, expanding on the JT guide and making it more accessible to youth as well in future. Uh Davis Suzuki Foundation, Sacred Earth Solar, Indigenous Climate Action. Please look out for more events like this. We want to engage with our Indigenous communities more and feel free to reach out to us. So um, it's not just sharing resources, but we're really interested in seeing how we can support and amplify the work that you're all doing. Last thing I would say is right now there's an urgency and a necessity for Indigenous-led climate solutions grounded in self-determination healing and justice. And so these are the ones that are being put forth in the guide and really follow us online and follow, um, watch the Earth. I mean, watch Power to the People and just, yeah, follow us and learn, learn these stories so you can implement them in your own community. Thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, hi. Very nice content, everyone. Nice content now. Ooh.